Hello, I'm Colleen Holder and this is Let's Talk Tobago. Today we're in Corland overlooking the popular YMCA facilities. This place is commonly referred to as the Y. It was commissioned in September 2010 and features two swimming pools. The YMCA offers a number of swimming classes and activities. At present, it's the only one of its kind on the island, but that is set to change as there are plans to construct other aquatic facilities in Kendall and Bacalet. We'll go down and show you around this facility in a bit, but first, here's what's happening in our stories this week. Water for all. No, it's not just another political catchphrase. Wasa has started the work that will make this a reality for those communities without a daily supply. Tobago schools demonstrate they can do the right thing always. And a look at the Tobago Jazz Experience. Tobago, ready to provide your community with the highest degree of professional services in emergency response. Contact Sid Mariah at 660-0065 or Sid Speyside at 660-6096. Sid 24-hour services, emergencies, medical or other. Sid Pro, the new face of emergency management. Welcome back. This is Let's Talk Tobago and today you're joining us at the YMCA in Corland. The construction of this facility and its swimming pools cost just about $12 million, the majority of which came from the Tobago House of Assembly and the National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago. The remainder came from corporate sponsors and over 150 individual donors. To honor the contributors, the Y has erected several plaques on the compound. Now, as far as we are aware, this facility doesn't encounter any problems getting water, but the same can't be said for some communities across Tobago. It's a fact of life that many households don't get a 24-7 supply. There are those who point to the irony here since there are so many sources on the island. But don't worry, Wasa is paying attention. They're working to ensure that all Tobagonians have access to water no matter where they live. The authority has embarked on an island-wide project. Umadar Mills has that story. Nestled in the forested and hilly northern region of Tobago are communities such as Castara and Palo Tovere. And although they are loved by visitors for their tranquil and relaxed atmosphere, there's a problem of inconsistent water supply, a matter which Wasa is working on improving through its Bloody Bay Pipeline project. This will see nine kilometers of iron pipe laid from the Bloody Bay station to the well at Little Englishman's Bay. The project involves laying um, a larger size pipeline, but it will also allow us to bring another well in Bloody Bay on stream. So in other words, the production will also in increase. It's expected that the project, which started in January, will be finished by June of this year. But those aren't the only communities in the north to get a boost in their water supply via the laying of pipes. The residents in Seaview, Mount Thomas, Culloden and Moriah also live in places where the terrain makes it a challenge for them to get pipe-borne water regularly. But these changes will ensure that the system does not ration the water supply, which essentially cuts off some communities at varying times. By laying this other line, we, we will be using a transmission distribution system 
and with pressure reduction. So it's basically a change in the way we operate. With the additional transmission line, we would be able to, with pressure reduction, serve everybody at the same time. The laying of three kilometers of PVC pipe from Culloden Junction to Broad Road Moriah has already been completed. Now it's only minor residential connections needed to be made so that persons can enjoy a 24-7 supply of water. I'm Omadara Mills for Let's Talk Tobago. Small bites, big threat. This could easily be mistaken for one of those slogans warning us to watch what we eat in order to stave off obesity. But it's not. It's a different health hazard, one that kills more than one million people every year. It's estimated that diseases carried by mosquitoes, flies, ticks and other insects cause chronic illness and serious suffering for hundreds of millions around the world. These diseases are referred to as vector-borne diseases. So far, this island has avoided any major outbreak or pandemic. But health officials know the only way they can maintain this status quo is to sensitize the public about what's at stake. And as Davia Chambers tells us, they've started that campaign. Vector-borne diseases like dengue, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, is prevalent in all Caribbean countries because the Aedes mosquito exists almost everywhere. 40% of the world's population is at risk of contracting dengue. So in Tobago, these participants weren't just walking for fun. They want to raise awareness of this potential risk. And they started by warming up with aerobics. And then they were ready, fully energized, for the walk, which started from the Department of Public Health in Signal Hill. Through Orange Hill, into Mount Murray, then onto Wilson Road and Gardenside Street. They finally ended at the Botanical Gardens, with some even coming in in groups, and then they warmed down. And if that wasn't enough, the participants also had to participate in a fitness treasure hunt. But the walk is just one way in which the Public Health Department is sensitizing the public on vector-borne diseases. The department will also utilize education campaigns. Vector-borne diseases can be prevented by wearing clothing that acts as a barrier to exposure to bites, using mechanisms to keep vectors out of houses such as screens on doors, windows and eaves, Reducing breeding sites near houses or in communities by covering water storage containers, eliminating puddles and a drainage of places where water accumulates, eliminating unusable containers where water pools, and controlling garbage in yards and gardens. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. Not everyone learns at the same rate or is able to cope with the normal school system. This could become frustrating for parents who have no place to take their children with learning disabilities. It's why there's a school in Tobago to help those who are faced with these challenges. Today, the focus is on Happy Haven, an institution that started in 1976, but is not just about mastering the basics. There, the students are provided with life skills and a good physical environment which allow them to become productive members of society, despite their mental or physical disorders. These are some of the 31 students of the Happy Haven School learning to play our national instrument. In addition to learning music, these students, whose ages range from 15 to 21 years old, are schooled in reading, writing and arithmetic. But they're also involved in several therapeutic classes to help them cope with Down's syndrome, autism and other disorders that affect their developmental progress. We have a program called Healing with Horses, where they go out and they do therapy with the horses. We also have swimming and water therapy. We have craft, they do craft classes, and physical training is a big thing for them. The physical space in which the students learn is also important. Over the years, the school has expanded. The latest are three new classrooms and the principal's office all constructed by the Division of Education, Youth Affairs and Sport. The classrooms are much larger, they're very spacey, quite comfortable. These rooms are air-conditioned, so at least the children have a measure of comfort. The expansion also means that more special educational needs children can be accommodated at the school. Currently, the demand for children with special education, with special needs, has increased in the island of Tobago. And because of the construction of that wing, the division was able to the school to have more children registering in that school. 
Employment is also a big part of giving back to the community. And here at the Happy Haven Institution, opportunities are provided for students to enter the world of work. We are trying to place some of our young men especially. We were quite fortunate in that the Tobago Heritage Park would have requested to have the services of you know a couple of our students and we have three students who are now fully employed at the Heritage Park. Besides the new wing, the Division of Education, Youth Affairs and Sport also plans to repair the school's driveway. I'm Omdara Mills for Let's Talk Tobago. We're taking a break, but stay with us to find out how some of our students convinced a panel of judges that they do the right things always. There are now significant traffic changes in the Shore Park area following the opening of the roundabout. Drivers can continue to proceed south on Orange Hill Road from the Claude Noel Highway, but they will no longer be able to turn right into the gas station or onto the Crusoe Bypass. Instead, from the Claude Noel Highway, turn south onto Old Government Farm Road, east onto the Crusoe Bypass, go around the roundabout, get into the left lane, and head north onto Orange Hill Road to the gas station. This message brought to you by the Division of Infrastructure and Public Utilities. Thanks for staying with us. You're viewing Let's Talk Tobago and we're at the YMCA. This mirror frame made from driftwood and other seaside collectibles is just one of the locally made craft pieces you'll find in the main office here at the Y. These pieces complement the many trophies and medals which are on display at the YMCA's swim club. Many of these were won during the two annual competitions which have been hosted since 2011, the Tobago Primary and Secondary Schools competition and an invitational featuring clubs from Trinidad. We're moving from here in Corland to take you across to Scarborough. Let's turn our attention now to a project which finally addressed the poor conditions of the Bacalet Connector Road. It has put an end to dodging oncoming traffic and danger. It's now a smooth ride. No more waves or bumps when you drive along the Bacalet Connector Road heading in or out of Scarborough. The road was recommissioned by the Division of Infrastructure and Public Utilities. Their specialist engineer, Kevon Trestrail, explains why the previous road was in that particular condition. The roadway was suffering from what is known as corrugation and waving. Corrugation and waving is a form of plastic movement typified by ripples or an abrupt wave across the pavement surface. The distortion is perpendicular to the traffic direction and usually occurs at points where traffic starts and stops and on steep slopes. Mr. Trestrail says the road was repaired in four phases. Phase one, the coal milling of the existing asphalt surface, which was carried out by the contractor, C-Ram Brothers Limited. Phase two, the repairs to the sub-base. This involved the removal of existing sub-base, which was compromised, and the placement of new material. Phase three, the addition of more lateral space to allow extra lanes at the Claude Noel and Backlight Connector intersection. And phase four, the repaving of the roadway. This is something that many motorists describe as a long time in coming. It's okay, much better than it was before, because it was scary driving on it before. <laughs> it's good because no longer is that bumpy feeling when you're coming down, it's, it's really good. It was bumpy, and I guess that um, the traveling public will enjoy riding it right now. The road repairs were done over a 14-day period. I'm Davia Chambers. For Let's Talk Tobago. There's the never-ending debate about ethics and morality. Many believe these value systems no longer exist in society, some arguing they've vanished from public life altogether. It's perhaps part of the reason the Integrity Commission of Trinidad and Tobago embarks on a competition which seeks to promote an understanding of integrity and the behavior it brings about. The commission chose a special target audience, our students. This is how Tobago fared. I not thinking evil. Godliness, righteousness is the yes way to go. But if all your end catch it already, this is my way of spelling integrity. That's just one of the winning pieces by the students of the Mason Hall Secondary School. It was written for the Integrities Commission's Do Right Champions competition in 2013. 
Another student in the speech band, Tiffany Duncan, explains why she took part in this competition. I saw it as a really good opportunity for our school to get a better advantage, a better name than everybody describes our school as we not performing on those things. So I want our school to be seen as better than that. The speech band category is unique to the competition since the Tobago secondary schools were the only ones involved, an aspect which has been promoted by the Division of Education, Youth Affairs and Sport. It really allows you to think because you, know, you have to just, you don't just go up there and speak and say what you want to say, but you have to learn it and when you have to learn things you internalize it and therefore the impact is extended from just one person to five, six, seven persons. But that's not the only aspect of the competition which Tobago students participated in. Short story writing is another category, and this one targets the primary schools. Nine-year-old Elisha Johnson of Speyside Anglican Primary School is the winner of this category. Let's listen to her ideas of what doing the right thing means from her story entitled, The Day I Had Superpowers. I took away a knife from a student who was going to stop another student. I helped my teacher with the students in the class who cannot read and did not want to do their work. In Tobago, 20 primary schools and five secondary schools participated in the Integrity Commission's competition, which is part of their public education approach to spread the ideals of integrity and ethics and the youths of Tobago are showing they understand its importance. After today, you're going to learn about integrity. What's that mommy that is doing the right thing, even when no one is not around to see? I'm Umadara Mills for Let's Talk Tobago. Staying with the youth theme, let's introduce you to a club that came calling. They wanted to know more about the capital of paradise. Why? Davia Chambers explains. Tobago attracts many visitors, for varying reasons, but this group did not make the journey merely for enjoyment. They came to strengthen ties with the police youth clubs on the island for a special event. This month and part of next month we're going to host the um, commissioners, com Caribbean Commissioners Conference. I think most of them come in to not only get other information but uh, get a reduction of the youth club. Mm -hmm. So I guess they're going to take back what we have to offer with a view of implementing it in their country. But to be able to confidently speak about our youth clubs, the team must also understand the history of this island. Over um, 200 plus years ago, um, Tobago was made one of several independent self-governing territories under the Grenada government. A history of the assembly was also on the agenda. Tobago at this point, is different from Trinidad in that sense. Whereas in Trinidad there is a two-chamber parliament. In Tobago we have a single-chamber house. The members of the Police Youth Club also participated in a mock debate in the house. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. It's time to take another break, but on the other side, all that jazz. It's a roundup of the events you've missed. This is Let's Talk to Big, and we're coming to you from the Coraland at the YMCA. This 25-meter swimming pool is where most of the Y's swimming classes are conducted. If you're enrolled in the adult and school swim classes, it happens right here. This pool is also used by the seniors, as you can see, for their aqua aerobics. School vacation swim camps and swimming courses for flight attendants are also held right here. And there's no need for the parents of our tiny tots to feel left out. There's also a pool for them. Now in Tobago, the village of Buku is known for many things. Among them, the village's Sunday school and its steel pan ensemble, NLCB Buccaneers. But there's an event that's bigger than just this community, and some might argue even bigger than this island. It's the annual Goat and Crab Race Festival. 
It started many years ago and is Tobago's equivalent to horse racing, minus the high street fashion and large elaborate hats. This is what you've been missing. A few things last after a couple of years, but after 89 years, this is still a hit, the annual goat and crab race festival. It's a sport unique to Tobago and continues to draw visitors near and far. We're here for Easter vacation, so um, we saw this you know, would be a fun, fun place to be. We're having a great time here. We love it. The goat race is my first time. I love it. And we really like the goat that escaped on its own and it finished the race without the jockey. It's great. I have never seen such fit goats. Fit, really fit goats. And it's fantastic. The whole ambience and everything is really, really great. So far, it's nice. It's good. It's good. I liked it, yeah. I'll be back again. But what really excites these patrons is watching the goats they betted on compete. Well, if you'd place a wager on this goat, Magnum, that won the $10,000 Buku Derby, then you did well. I'm proud and um, I will say that my hard work had paid off because it's not easy to mine and train these goats. It's like uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, every morning before these days, the, the, the Monday and Tuesday, I've been working hard with these animals and uh, they, they, they show that they would have been in good form and shape. So I had expected to win this race. Even when they ask me out there what I think, I tell them straight off, I'm going to win the race. Although the goat racing is extremely competitive, the crab races are simply for pleasure. And in case you missed it, here are a few more goat races. And that's a day at the races, Tobago style. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. For nine days, Tobago came alive. This island made it onto everyone's to-do list. They wanted to be here for the long Easter weekend and the Tobago jazz experience. And as Kishon Wilson tells us, our visitors discovered that there was much more to do than lounge on the beach. They got a chance to enjoy a bit of carnival outside of the season. We mostly hear about Pan during the carnival season for competitions like Panorama. But to ensure that the national instrument is appreciated throughout the year, NLCB Buccaneers hosted a pan fiesta at the Buku Integrated Facility. They never let me down. They always come to give me a good show. And I am sure they will show off that show this evening. Put your hands together for Tobago Panthers. Our boy Steel Orchestra, we would have asked them to come and they were excited. And I must say thanks to them for coming. And I will let you all know, you all came for a labor of love. It was a time for young pan players, as well as older ones, to showcase their skills and passion for music. This is the third annual Pan Fiesta held by NLCB Buccaneers. I'm Keyshawn Wilson for Let's Talk Tobago. It's been declared the biggest jazz festival to date. And if there was any doubt, Jazz in the East helped to answer some of those questions. Here's what you missed and a wrap-up of Hillside Jazz from Davia Chambers. The thousands who converged in Speyside for the beginning of the Tobago Jazz Experience 2014. That was what got Jazz in the East started, a fiery soca performance from Roy Cape All-Stars. Oh, 
but the man of the moment, Jamaican reggae artist Taurus Riley, he made the traffic headaches many endured to get into Speyside all worth it. Over to Hillside Jazz, it was a celebration of music as locals got the chance to make their debut performance on the stage of Tobago Jazz Experience. The nine-day event ended on Sunday, April 27th. I'm Davia Chambers for Let's Talk Tobago. This one. And it's time to have your say, the segment of our program where we hear from you, our viewers. Now, you may have a plot of land, but you're unable to build on it because you just can't afford it. You also don't want a grant because you don't have a house. Well, you're no longer alone. There's a plan in place for you. It's called the Beneficiary Owned Land Program and it provides you with the assistance you need to build on your existing plot of land. So today we're asking, would you be able to take advantage of this program? This is what you said. I will take advantage of the finance given for people that have land to build their own house because in that way now, you building actually what you want and nobody building what they want for you. Yes, I would be able to take advantage of something like that because my family, we own some land, but the challenge for the um, people in the family would always be, especially the young people, how you're financing that. I, I would say yes, in a, in a way that is once an opportunity is available to people and it is there right now, people should make use of that opportunity. It's a very good idea and um, a lot of people in Tobago, they have is land and eligible? this is a good idea that you could just um, get the finance to build their own property. It will benefit us in the, in the long run, you know, and it's a good thing for the young people to get into, to get their own house. And that's how we bring this week's edition of Let's Talk Tobago to a close. Remember, you can send us your comments or queries on anything you've seen in this program to information at tha.gov.tt or visit us at www.tha.gov.tt. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Colleen Holden. On behalf of all of us at the Department of Information, have a safe and enjoyable week. And as we go, we leave you now with Jazz on the Waterfront, a New Orleans-style event from the Milford Road Esplanade.